This is the Microsoft Cloud Show, episode 206. Today, CJ and I are going to catch you up on the latest news from the Microsoft Cloud, recorded live August the 1st, 2017. Give CodeShip Pro a try. More teams than ever are using Docker and Linux for their .NET applications. CodeShip Pro is a fully customizable, continuous integration and delivery service in the cloud with the best support for any team that is using .NET and Docker together and can run builds on Linux environments. CodeShip Pro comes with ready-to-use integrations for Azure, including Azure Container Service and more. It also offers a free, convenient local CLI tool that allows you to run your builds locally and is the only hosted CI CD tool that lets you build your own environment, giving you the most control and flexibility no matter what tool or stack you're trying to use. Check out CodeShip Pro's free plan that grants 100 builds per month, unlimited projects and unlimited users. Open source projects are always free on CodeShip. Visit CodeShip.com today or check out CodeShip.com slash features slash pro to learn more. Good morning, CJ. How you doing, mate? I'm okay. I'm a little irritated. Yeah. A little bummed out, so... We have an admission to make. Yeah, we... I'm just going to say flat out, it is surprisingly hard to interview people for a podcast, technically, when you're not in the same room. <laughs> it does sound really silly, doesn't it? But it is actually true. We... So, just for the punchline to the whole thing, is that CJ and I were supposed to, if you noticed last week, we missed an episode... We told you at the end of episode 205 that we would be having another interview with Paul Stubbs from Microsoft talking about mm. doing our second installment on the Microsoft AI story, We're talking about the bot framework specifically. And we knew when we recorded the interview that some stuff was a little screwy with the, the audio file from Paul's side, but it just got screwed up. Our producer looked at the file. He worked on it. He's like, there's just no way we can work with this. And when, yeah. when he's, when Rade says, there's just no way we can work with it. If you've seen the, some of the stuff that we've sent Rade, that's like, there's no way you're going to do it. This guy's a magician. He's fixed some ridiculous files. We talked a little bit about some of the scripts we had in episode 200, but yeah, it was just screwed up. And so we didn't find out about it until the night before. We were going to ship that episode 206 that it was no good. So we're going to have to get back together with uh, Paul. And plus, we got to record the rest of our AI stuff. But yeah. yeah, so sorry for missing a week last week. But we've used a service called Zencaster to where it records locally for each person. That gets screwed up sometimes. We now back up stuff using something called Call Recorder for Skype. So it's recording... Mm the stream from both CJ and myself through Call Recorder, that's not ideal because that I'm recording it on my machine. And so if there's any kind of a network issue between CJ and the internet or the internet and me, then CJ's feed gets a little screwy for my recording. So we also record independently and we'll just mash everything together so it sounds fine. But, you know, it's just flat out stupid how hard this really is. And it's really painful that you don't find out about it until after the fact. Yeah, kind of daft. And really annoying because it was a great interview, and um, it sucks when that happens. We've had a couple of a couple of those where it's just balked up the recordings. Anyway, unrecoverable. So apologies for missing out on an episode last week. Yeah, we will catch up on it though. We we do want to re-record that interview, so we will come back to it in the future. We just I can't tell you when the future is, other than sometime beyond now. Yeah, fair enough. How's that for a deep <laughs> statement? <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah. So hey, CJ, what have you been up to lately? What have I been up to lately? I'm trying to think of something interesting outside of my normal working my ass off at work. <laughs> what have I been up to lately? No, just working my ass off at work. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, uh, I just got back from a week of vacation. Well, I'm going to put that in quotes. It was a week of vacation with the in-laws. So Yes. It was still, it was good. We had a good time. Sat on the beach for a lot of it. Uh, it was a bit of a bummer. My son's still recovering from knee surgery, so he couldn't really go to the beach. We did manage to rent a kind of like a, a beach wheelchair. It's got these giant inflatable things. It makes it really easy to wheel yeah. into the beach, but when you've got a knee brace on, it's hot. Yeah, I saw those photos. It looks like he could have just floated out into the ocean in that thing. This one was made of metal, so the, the inflatables, it probably wouldn't have worked too well because it would have flipped him over, strapped onto the chair, and it, the wheels would have floated, but it would have drowned him. <laughs> yeah, I'm cool. But, yeah. Um, yeah, it was. It made it really easy to push him down to the beach, but it was only available for 48 hours, which kind of sucked, but mm. anyway, it was fine. But uh, Nice. Still a good getaway to the beach. Yeah. That's awesome. Hey, I've, I've made a big change, big technical change in Ooh. the last... I guess week or so. It's been a long time coming, but I know you and I were just talking about a little bit off the off the show. But I've pretty much 
decided to switch. I was a Dropbox person, keeping all my stuff mm -hmm. in Dropbox. I kept my notes in, in OneNote, but those were synced with Microsoft Cloud. And I've never really been much of a fan of OneDrive. I, I just between different issues of things kind of cropping up and not. I've never really had a problem with Dropbox. I was like, all right, I just stick with Dropbox. No real reason to go back to mm -hmm. OneDrive, even though I tried it. I'm not going to say anything negative about OneDrive. It just it it didn't work for me. And share external sure. sharing was a pain. But I have recently done almost a complete switch or a platform switch to where I don't pay for Dropbox anymore, and I've switched everything over to Google Drive, and uh, use that now for just like my cloud-based storage. And uh, because I also am a big user of um, of Google Docs, Google Sheets, just a couple of the different apps there, because it just it's so simple to share stuff with people who are not in your organization. Visibility of what's being shared and with who is so simple. Authoring online, offline authoring is simple. It's just, you had a comment about that. We started using it now for the podcast too, where we, we were using OneNote, but trying to do the co-authoring in OneNote never really worked out all that well. But now we're using it for this episode and sure it looks good now, but you had an interesting kind of insight too about like, you know, the, the difference here on switching over to this too that I thought that would be interesting for our listeners. It just sort of struck me. And this is going to sound really sort of naive and basic, I think, but it kind of struck me that Microsoft's philosophy is to build tools that work really well inside a company, and Google's philosophy seems to be to build tools that really work well between companies, and neither do a very good job of the other's kind of focus, I guess, right? So there are issues with Google inside a company, and there's issues with Microsoft outside a company. That's where their strengths and weaknesses lie. It just sort of struck me as a a really simple way to sort of boil it down that the Google tools seem to be first and foremost built to be able to deal well with working with people from a bunch of different places. And Microsoft seemed to be focused around working well with a bunch of people from the same place. So I don't know, maybe in a nutshell, that is, there's probably some truth to that, just the way they approach things. And Microsoft's tools are obviously built to work really well inside enterprises or to, to be better at that first and foremost, but not to say that they're not doing features and things to try and encroach into the other's focus areas or get better at those other things. But it sort of struck me as like, well, if you're like you and you work with a bunch of different people from a bunch of different places, then it's kind of no surprise really that Google do a better job of it right now. Yeah, I think that you hit the nail on the head, at least for me. I mean, it's I don't work in an enterprise that has a lot of, a lot of employees and sharing stuff between people in the enterprise. So I don't get to experience all that, that nice kind of stuff with Delve and with OneDrive and things that, that are pretty much made for, for people who work at the same company in the same domain, the same identity network. I'm more, I'm outside. I'm a single single entrepreneur, single uh, solo business that it makes it, I do like how simple Google makes it to put stuff. I, I used to have that whole fear of, uh, Google knows so much information about me now, I don't really care to put it in there and blah, blah, blah. But I mean, I think that I'm going to be a little naive and say, hey, I think that all the privacy stuff that's going around and the interest there is a good way for the public and society to kind of put the pressure on Google saying, you don't have all that information about me. But the other side is too is, you know, in one sense, I really don't care. I'm more, I went back and forth to somebody on Facebook the other day and they were complaining about Skype. And I'm like, hey, I fixed my Skype problem. I use Hangouts. And yeah, they're like, gotcha. yeah, but I know that says a lot for somebody who's so anti-Google. And I'm like, well, I'm kind of more anti-productivity anti now. So yeah. <laughs> let me just get my yeah, shit done. It's also definitely worth pointing out, right, that you, you have a certain set of needs for what you're doing, and it's not going to work for a large enterprise, right? Yep. They have a different set of big needs or a different set of needs and and requirements and things. And so it's picking the right set of tools for their for your requirements, I guess. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Hey, so why don't we jump into the news? Let's do it. While many IT teams struggle with the impact of deploying Office 365, Zscaler customers are experiencing 40% or greater network performance across file download times, as well as TCP and DNS connection times, compared to using next-gen firewalls and UTMs to route Office 365 traffic locally to the internet. While you may know Zscaler as the leader in cloud security, they also have hundreds of customers who are processing over 1.2 petabytes of Office 365 traffic monthly through the Zscaler cloud. Visit www.zscaler.com to learn more. What if you could take any process your teams use to get work done and make it happen automatically? What if you could save countless hours and help people work better together? Nintex can make that happen. With the Nintex platform, work flows from person to person, system to system, to the cloud and back. And it flows in and out of the tools that you use every day. 
With Nintex, work flows so your teams can work smarter, work faster, and be more connected than ever. Newsy stuff. All right, hey, look, there's some pretty significant newsy kind of stuff that kicked in here that we had this week or in the last two weeks. The first one, I want to touch on two of them, but one of them I want to go kind of quick through. The other one I want to spend a little more time on because I think it's at least... You and me, this is like an epic bit of news here that I thought we'd talk about. Mm. The first one is that Microsoft has joined what's called the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and they've joined them as a platinum member. This is a, the CNCF is part of the Linux Foundation, which helps govern a wide range of cloud oriented open source projects. A lot of these projects are really core to things like containers. So it's, you've got projects that are under the CNCF that people are familiar with, Kubernetes, which is a orchestrator for containers, Prometheus, which is an open source like analytics thing. Think about it like similar to application insights that Azure has to offer. Open Tracing, FluentD, Linkerd, ContainerD, Helm, gRPC. We'll have a link to this in the show notes, but uh, this is a pretty big thing of Microsoft kind of getting in and saying, you know, hey, we're behind this community based foundation, which is, has done a tremendous amount of work over the last few years. So it's nice to see Microsoft being added as a platinum sponsor to the, or platinum member to this. Yeah, that's really cool. Nice set of uh, progress forward. I guess it's no surprise with folks like Ross Gardler at Microsoft now and Brennan Burns and all those guys that, that uh, are doing things like this. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Really cool. The other bit of news here that I, that was pretty epic was related to the something you and I have talked about that we were hoping was coming way down the road, and it looks like it's kind of come, and it might it may not be for everybody, but it's pretty damn epic. Yeah, it is really exciting. Title of the blog post is by Corey Sanders, who's the director of Compute for Azure, is Fast and Easy Containers. It's a new service called Azure Container Instances. There's a nice big blog post to this, good quick starts to go take a look at it. But in a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen, it looks like Microsoft is the second one to really come out with a very open version of containers as a service. So yes. Google's got their offering. It's called GKE or Google Container Engine. It's essentially hosted Kubernetes. Azure Container Instances, though, takes this a little bit further. Basically, it's you don't have to worry about the virtual machines to host the uh, different container runtimes. You can just simply say, go give me a container. You point to the container you want to pull down and it spins up, runs the container for you. You only pay for the amount of time the container runs, the amount of storage space that it has, stuff like that. And you can have external orchestrators like Kubernetes even point to the Azure Container Instance or ACI, which coincidentally, Andrew Connell Incorporated, ACI, that's my company, <laughs> ACI, works good. But anyway, the uh, what's cool about it, I think, is that you, know, you can sit there and point to it and say, like, that's a massive virtual machine and it has no limits on the number of containers and everything that are there. Azure takes care of the stuff under the covers of how many virtual machines it needs to be able to run your containers, make them redundant, fault tolerant, et cetera. This is pretty yeah. badass. It's pretty, I think it's a really interesting first step, right? Like it's, it's them signaling, hey, we're cool with getting into CAS or container as a service. And it's kind of where everybody's been looking as the future, right? And so it'll be interesting to see what else comes. It's pretty basic at the moment. It's pretty easy to get started with as well. So if you're interested in containers, you don't want to deal with standing up machines and doing all that sort of stuff. You can do it all just with the Azure CLI real quick, spin up a container, get a little website running in no time at all, and, um, and have a play around with it. Super, super duper easy. It really is. I love the fact that you can, you know, just sit there and point to. You don't even have to fire up like Docker on your machine now. I have Docker installed. You can just have the Azure CLI up and type in a command, and a container goes yeah. and runs, and then it goes away. And you only pay for what's running there once you set the service up. I mean, that's. It doesn't matter. It, the container can live in the Docker Hub registry. Can live inside of your own Azure uh, registry using RBAC support. So for a private image, this is freaking awesome. Yeah, it's amazing. I'm just looking forward to seeing where they go with it and adding more support for more, uh, obviously, more capabilities and all that sort of stuff. Would be pretty sweet. Yeah, it'll be interesting when they finally have like I love to see like a hosted version of Kubernetes to where then you could point to this and then say, you know what? Then it is true. I have no infrastructure stuff I have to worry about. That would be really nice, wouldn't it? So today, if you want to do something like that, you're going to stand up at least 
one virtual machine. Kubernetes doesn't like playing as, as a uh, multi-master mode. So you're going to stand at one virtual machine that's got Kubernetes installed. You're then going to point, you could then point it to the ACI and say, that's where I want my stuff, my containers to run. I'm curious to poke a little bit more into this, finding things like how you can do like, you know, shared storage, how you can have things allocated, how you can spin things up, be kind of warm up for, for different pieces, how the networking works. But uh, it's not for every single solution, but it's great for a simple workload you want to spin up. This paired with Azure Functions, very cool. Yeah, for sure. Very exciting. Something slightly less techy, but pretty interesting. I think we covered Microsoft's latest earnings report, the basics of it, a couple of shows ago, or a show ago. I forget which now. But one thing I found, I found an article by uh, Ina Freed, and it was about the earnings report. So I won't cover all of those details, but one of the interesting tidbits was that in the financial, I guess, call that they have, Amy Hood, who's Microsoft's CFO, told analysts that for the first time, Microsoft got more revenue from Office 365 subscriptions than from traditional Office licensing. So this is really interesting because we've sort of, we talked a little bit about Google Drive and all that sort of stuff, but one of Microsoft's most profitable businesses is Office 365. And it obviously has been for many decades, the Office business in general, along with the Windows business. And although the Windows business is dropping at about 2% per annum, I think, right now. Office seems to have been making the transition pretty nicely from that three-year software cycle to um, you know monthly subscriptions. And it's not just in the commercial sector, it's also across consumer sector as well. But I just thought it was really interesting. That that's, so now it's, you know, that tipping point of subscriptions now make up more revenue than box product for Office, which is kind of a huge deal in my view. I, it, it seems totally obvious, but when you're talking about that many billions and billions of dollars and everybody buying on subscription, that's pretty fascinating from a business model perspective. It's a great thing for a business model perspective. I mean, you can tell that the, the business community likes it because that Microsoft stock is on an absolute terror. I think it's up in the 70s now. Yep. As we speak, it's at 72.82, in fact. So glad I sold it when it got to 31. So, <laughs> that was a brilliant move. It, this is a move that started with Steve Ballmer. It was nice to, and, and really has been pushed harder and harder by Satya. But I mean, it, this big reason for this is, you know, the, the move that they went to Office 365 and it's one of the, it's the big driver for the Microsoft cloud revenue. So, I mean, we still have Azure, but Office 365, that's the cash cow for Microsoft these days. And it's a, Big chunk of change and nice recurring revenue. It's not not as easy just to pop off that and go to a different platform. Like if you want to switch to a different version of Office, you want to go to a different yeah, totally. you know, something else. It just it's nice to be able to have that nice recurring revenue. Yeah, for sure. I think we've joked about this on the show before, but and I'm no financial advisor or anything, so you should go do your own research. But in my very amateur opinion, you should buy Microsoft stock when I'm not there and and sell it when I am there <laughs> because um. <laughs> Every time I'm there, it it drops or <laughs> goes nowhere. And every time I leave, it starts skyrocketing. So, <laughs> you know, anecdotally, <laughs> I'm bad for the company. <laughs> yeah. I got a couple of quick hits here on the Azure front, some Azure updates. Uh, there's an interesting article here by Florent Portiner. Sorry for, if I mispronounced that, but it's on the Azure Stack blog. Um, this is not official Microsoft, but it's a link from a guy talking about when Microsoft announced the, the updates in the last few weeks or so, last month, where you could have nested virtualization. So you could create a virtual mm. machine and then put virtual machine in Azure and then create virtual machines within that. What someone did is they show you how to take a very big virtual machine and how you can install Azure Stack inside of that virtual machine inside of Azure. So you can now have your own private cloud inside of the Microsoft public cloud. So a virtual machine hosted in Azure, then you install Azure Stack that can then create multiple virtual machines underneath it and run Azure Stack in a hosted way, which is kind of inception-ish and it's not at all supported. But hey, it's a it's an interesting way to do a little proof of concept to see is Azure Stack going to work without buying all the hardware from a, a supported vendor like Dell or HP. Yo, dog. I saw you want a VM, so I put some VMs in your VMs, inside your VMs. <laughs> With spinner things, right? With spinner oh, sorry, things, that's, exactly. That's your point. Uh, put a screen on there it. You go. 
<laughs> yeah. Two other little bits of uh, quickfire news. New Azure Storage Overview Blade is in the portal that you can go take a look at. It's got some cool stuff with uh, additional metrics, easier ways to configure things like cores and see uh, the details about it. And another little bit of news from Microsoft, which is Azure mm -hmm. leads in the, the industry in ISO certifications. They've recently added a new ISO certification for Azure, just Azure in general. But for the Azure government offering that they have, there are five new ISO standards that they've just added. So I'll have a link to this article in the show notes from the Azure blog or from the, yeah, from the Azure blog that lists out all the different ISO standards. It's a bunch of numbers. I'm not going to try and read these out, but. Yeah, I'm sure they mean a lot to the people that they mean a lot to. <laughs> you are full of detail <laughs> of just like very introspective stuff. That's Yoda level 10 right there. <laughs> <laughs> what now, Bruce, they mean. <laughs> anyway, what else you got for us? I've got some more Office 365 news. Apparently, OneDrive is recognized as a leader in the Gartner Magic Quadrant for content collaboration platforms. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm remembering a tweet. I saw a tweet come out the other day, and then a blog post that was that it linked to. And there's a guy that went out and took when Gartner put out this post or their latest magic quadrant for, what is it, for leader in content organization and platform. Mm. Do you know that Dropbox, Google Drive, and OneDrive all came out with things touting themselves in the exact same magic quadrant, exact same quadrant about all the stuff. They all, they all kind of based on say, look what magic quadrant did for all of, for us. And it's like, so you just kind of makes me feel better switching from Dropbox to Google Drive, and I'm not using OneDrive, well, kind of all the same. Yeah, gotcha. It is interesting the way this way different uh, folks spin this. Microsoft is in the top right-hand quadrant, along with Box, Dropbox, Google, Citrix, Xway, whatever that is, and Ignite. The big ones, Microsoft, Box, Dropbox, and Google. Citrix is in there. I've never used their products. So I can't really comment on it. Microsoft are the, are the top of the ability to execute Access, which are the you know, is the vertical axis, and box are far are further to the right in terms of completeness of vision. So, so box are only a little bit lower in their ability to execute, but quite a long way further in terms of their completeness of vision. So, the way I would say this is, Microsoft are being given a run for their money by box, and there isn't that much in it. Like, box is only slightly lower than them in the ability to execute, which I thought was pretty interesting. And but far, far further across on the completeness of vision. So um, although Microsoft are touting this as a quite a big sort of win, and it is good that they're the leader in the ability to execute, it's still kind of curious that according to Gartner, you know, they are the closest in that quadrant, in that top right quadrant, they are the closest to not being in the leader quadrant for a completeness of vision and and have the potential to drop into the challenger bucket, not the leader bucket, if they're not careful, because they're kind of approaching that boundary. So, yeah, I mean, they've taken it and um, put some nice news around this, said that 85% of the Fortune 500 are running, or companies, sorry, I should use these words very, very carefully because there's you could read between the lines here. With over 85% of the Fortune 500 companies having OneDrive, and SharePoint across 250,000 organizations worldwide. We're delivering on our vision for a more connected workplace. In fact, usage of OneDrive for Business has more than doubled in the last year alone. So yeah, that's um, they're making it sound pretty good. but uh, And they have done pretty well. But I just thought it was interesting that they're so far behind on the vision side of things. Yeah, and it's interesting how they have it, how they have that set up. I mean, when you see the list of everyone, I mean, how far Box is out. I mean, it's go to the show notes and you'll see a a link to this article with the, the Magic Quadrant shown up. It's interesting to see how far out Box is compared to the other big guys, Microsoft, Dropbox, and Google, and seeing companies like Citrix even above Microsoft, Dropbox, and Google on this. It depends on how you look at it. I mean, it's kind of, are you aiming for yourself to be as close to the top right as possible? If so, then, I mean, Citrix mm -hmm. does beat out Microsoft, Dropbox, and Google even when you look at, you know, trying to get to the top right, but it's interesting. Yeah, it's bizarre. Like, I don't know. You got to take these things with a grain of salt because there's a lot of schmoozing that goes behind these. That's, yeah, is you know, the one company that you mentioned. And I'm not going to mention them by name because I'm, I can't even pronounce them. But I don't even know if this is true. But yeah, I never even heard of this company that's on the visionary box. That just means they have a good marketing budget to fund donate something to Gartner, right? Their ARPR team. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Hey, so yeah. Speaking of Google, I have 
I'm going to say this in a bit of tongue in cheek, but to me, it's, it's a little funny, especially when you go look at the article. It does make sense. There's an article here by the Google Cloud Platform blog. It's called Introducing a Transfer Appliance Sneaker Net for the Cloud Era. Now, when you look at the first picture in this blog post, it's a picture that shows two different rack mounted servers, one in a 4U, one in a 2U capacity. And on the front of the servers, it says Google Cloud, but they're rack mounted. <laughs> So here's the idea is that they, they want to make it easy for you to be able to take data from your on-prem environment that you want to move to the cloud. And let's say you generate lots of data locally. You want to be able to get this to the cloud as fast as you can. This is the appliance to do it, at least for the Google Cloud platform. So this transfer appliance allows you to store stuff locally and then ship that over to Google. You scroll down a little bit, show a little animation. How, what if I want to one petabyte of data to be transferred up to Google Cloud. Well, it shows on one side, on a typical network with a 100 megabit connection, this is going to take somewhere around, oh, three years to get all the data up. Oh, sorry, 1,095 days, so three years. Mm. But if you decide to use the transfer appliance, it's probably going to take really closer to about 43 days in the terms of loading the data in the device, pulling the device out of your rack, sending it to Google, they load the data into their storage for you. 43 days, or as they say in parentheses, way faster. Oh, interesting. So you take this out of the rack when it's done and send it to Google, like the Snowball thing or whatever it is from Amazon? That's what it kind of looks like. like. I mean, when you look at the picture, of course, it doesn't really explain exactly how it works in the blog post, but in the picture, it very much looks mm, yeah. like that there's this blue section that you're going to be able to rip out, and that's got all the storage in it. And then you'd send that off and replace it with another big blue section that's in there to add additional capacity. Yeah, I see. So it's a it's a sneaker net. It's an, a fast way yeah. to go through and load your data. We can do something similar to this with Azure. We can do something similar to this with AWS, where you load up a drive, you use their import export feature. They have you encrypt it, load it on the drive, put a little token on there, ship it to them via FedEx or UPS or some other shipping company, they pull it out, load it into your storage, and then send you the drive back. It's the same kind of yeah, thing. Gotcha. This is just kind of more in out-of-the-box feature. Yeah, gotcha. They've got some interesting prices here. At the bottom, it says the 100 terabyte model is priced at 300 bucks plus shipping via FedEx, approximately $500 for shipping. <laughs> <laughs> so the shipping costs more than the thing. That's pretty interesting. The 480 terabyte model is priced at $1,800 plus shipping, approximately $900. That's pretty good. Yeah. I guess if you've got a boatload of data, then this is the this is the way to get it up there. Kind of makes sense if you're doing like machine learning, collecting lots of data from sensors locally. You need to be able to get it to the cloud to do stuff because you can't dictate your devices aren't local. There's some interesting scenarios you could use that for, but clearly somebody needs it, so they built it. Yeah, you definitely do take it out and ship it to them by the looks of it. Okay, I've got another one here. Using Azure scheduled events to prepare for VM maintenance. This is a video we'll link to, but there's also documentation on this thing called Azure Scheduled Events, and it's an API in preview, which is a REST API, which means that from within like virtual machines and um, stuff like that, you'll be able to query this internal API and get back a list of information from Azure about upcoming maintenance so you can take action. So for example, if you've got a virtual machine, that's got some sort of Windows service running on it or long running process or what have you, then you'll want to query this API and see when you've got scheduled maintenance and stuff like that scheduled for your virtual machine so that you can, you know, sort of pause during that period of time or, or take action somehow. But I just thought it was kind of interesting. This, this API you hit on the 169254, 169.254 address, my, uh, squares and circles in itself is quite liking that symmetricness of that IP address. <laughs> anyway, so you hit this metadata endpoint and it'll tell you about scheduled events that are coming up in a sort of a JSON return so you can uh, decide what to do and when to take action. Mm, that's cool. Kind of nifty, just kind of useful for inside virtual machines, tell you things like whether it's about to be paused, whether it's going to be rebooted, whether it's going to be redeployed, the resource type, the update domain, whether it's scheduled or whether it started and what have you. Kind of cool. Oh, that's cool. But yeah, Hanselman has a little video about it and what some of its uses are. Hmm. I see you, you post another link here about building apps faster with Azure Serverless. Yeah, so that was um so there's a new blog post came out July thirty first by Raman Sharma. I think they just link off to a really useful video about 
serverless compute and building with functions and all that sort of stuff. Not so much announcements per se, but just a good video about things like Azure Functions and Azure Logic Apps and how they can be used and what you could use them for and scenarios and stuff. If you want to get into serverless and building things with Azure Serverless, with their platform, it just gives a good overview. That was really all as a, just a useful resource more than anything. Gotcha. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Cool. Well, hey, you want to transition into some picks? We got some cool picks here. Yeah, that sounds good. Let's do it. The Microsoft Cloud Show is sponsored by Valid.nl. Valid's motto is stay ahead. Its mission is to enable its customers to excel in their business through the innovative use of IT. Valid is always on the lookout for new colleagues. Are you interested in all things happening in Azure, whether in infrastructure, SQL Server, Office 365, BI, SharePoint, or .NET? Look them up on valid.nl. So I have two rapid fire ones because they kind of related to each other. So one of them was by uh, motherboard.vice.com that was posted, I think it was about two weeks ago, sometime middle of July or something towards the end of July. And um, hmm, this is uh, the title of it's an interesting title for the article. It says, Start Rolling Your Blunts. NASA is uploading decades of archival footage to YouTube. So this is... Uh, they, my, <laughs> <laughs> so what they've done is NASA has just taken a bunch of old footage and they're just uploading up for YouTube for anybody to take a look at. It goes hand in hand with my other pick that I had, which is uh, that NASA just dropped a ton of rare footage on the SR-71 Blackbirds doing what they do best, flying fast. Yeah, this ruined an evening for yeah, me. I, I mean, yeah. it was awesome, but I got nothing else done. Yeah, there's a lot of pictures of the SR-71, of the YF-12. It's pretty cool. If you're a fan of... Just some of this nerdy aerospace videos. We have found a resource for you that will absolutely destroy your productivity. Yes. It's just aeronautical poor. Yeah. It really is. It's beautiful. There's very little narration. There's almost no there's no air narration on a lot of it. And it's just a video of an SR-71 taking off or of yeah. them dropping a, a scramjet test from a test flight. It's pretty cool. It goes really well with the book that I'm listening to, which is, um, have you read uh, Gene Kranz's Failure is Not an Option? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yep. It's great. I'm getting through it right now. Just got to Gemini last night. I really like it. So Yeah. Hey, well, hopefully we'll be talking about the SR-72 on the show at some point, which is some, you know, some super secret sneaky replacement for the Blackbird, something along those lines. Mark 6, apparently. Anyway. Ooh. Details for another show. <laughs> if you've ever used a, a Windows laptop and a Mac laptop, you'll notice this. When you open a Mac, it seems to join and get on Wi-Fi phenomenally quicker than the Windows PC. Yep. And I'd noticed this in the past, and others had commented on it as well, and I've seen various articles, but nobody really knew why. But anyway, this guy has done a teardown and written about it on his blog, and the blog is titled... Rapid DHCP, or how do Macs get on the network so fast? <laughs> <laughs> and he tears it down in terms of the network protocols and exactly the commands that are being sent and in which order and showing basically why MacBooks get on the Wi-Fi network so fast. And there's reason to the madness. Like, it, you're not making it up. It's for real. And it's all to do with the way they um, they discover and find the network quicker. I should say discover and find networks that they've been on previously, recently, quicker. They basically start sending out a bunch of requests, presuming that chances are you're joining an existing network that you've already been on before. And um, so they fire that out to, I think, three or eight, something like that, of the previous DHCP servers. Yeah, start sending requests out for DHCP to DHCP servers for the last three or four or five networks based on what they get back, then they'll join that, right? So they're basically being a bit more sort of presumptuous about that the network that you're trying to join is probably still there. Anyway, it turns out you could join network way faster that way. So you're not making it up. It was for real. Max join Wi-Fi networks faster. Very cool. Yeah, kind of interesting. So I don't know if you saw, but Microsoft removed the Find Time application from the Office Store oh. a while back. I heard some rumor that they've decided to change that terrible, terrible decision. Because Find Time was one of the most useful apps in the Office Store for uh, for Outlook. Anyway, I've moved on, and um, I found a new service called Doodle, D O O D L E dot com, and it's really really simple, and it's really basic, and it works really well. Huh. 
And Microsoft have this new thing at calendar.help, I believe is their new supposed replacement for find time, but it's a bot. So if you and I were talking over email, you said, hey, AC, we really need to meet, you know, to talk about this. You could add the calendar.help email address to the thread and say, hey, Cortana, schedule a meeting with Andrew and I sometime this week or whatever. And then she'd kick in and start trying to negotiate the meeting and giving us options and all that sort of stuff. I don't know about you. I'm kind of old school. Just give me a web page with options I can click on. Yep. And that's what Find Time did and did very well. But Doodle integrates with Office 365, with Gmail, Calendar, all of those existing things that you'd expect. Really straightforward to add people, pick times that work, come to an agreement, schedule the meeting, no worries. Hmm. Free? There is a free plan, yes. Oh, interesting. Yep. Cool. Yeah. There's also paid plans for teams and for branding. You know how you've, in the past, you've published your calendar for people? Yes. So they're free busy, so you can go see. They do stuff like that too. Ah. And so you could do like a branded, here's my calendar free busy kind of experience in the paid plan, I think. There's things like that in the paid versions. But um, yeah, kind of the free getting started stuff is you can schedule meetings and all that sort of stuff, oh, as you'd expect. I'll have to take a look at it. That's, I, I was using free time, and then I started using something else. And then the other one was, uh, I liked it because it allowed me to block out and say, like, this is when I'm available. And so when someone were trying yeah. to schedule time, it would only... It would only give them that option and then exclude anything that was already scheduled during that time. So I like to only do conference calls or meetings or anything on Tuesdays, the same days we record. And so I have like a big like free block all on when that just goes for every Tuesday and just like, yeah, you want to schedule a meeting? Here's the link. Go schedule it. Pick it from here. Like you're not available on Wednesday. I'm like, nope, I work on Wednesday. I don't do phone calls. So yeah, gotcha. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Anyway, Doodle, give it a shot. It's pretty simple. Works really well. Finally, I think I've mentioned this on the show before, excuse my shitty memory, but the Space Center in Houston has launched a Kickstarter to restore historic mission control. So they're raising money to restore the historic mission control room that was used for a number of different missions, obviously, but probably the most historic would be the Apollo 11 moon landing mission. Um, it was used a lot in the Apollo era as well as the shuttle era as well. But they want to restore this. And turns out NASA doesn't have a whole lot of money. To do that, they're running a Kickstarter. They've already raised, as of August the 1st, they've raised $322,669 and um, out of a goal of 250000 So oh, they're doing all right. Good to go. There's currently 17 days to go. Uh, they've got 2,500 backers. But there's a bunch of different pledge levels, everything from stickers to... And if anybody wants to give them 10 grand, I would quite happily personally accompany you to meet Gene Kranz and tour the room, which, you know, <laughs> I'd be, re I know it doesn't sound like a great deal, <laughs> but, but at 10 grand or more, hey, if you're looking for a guest, I'll come see you. I'll come hang out. <laughs> I just looked at this. Uh, this is brand new for me. Did you know, so they have 10 of those awards are available? Or sorry, 10 of those awards were were available. They've already oh, all been, they've already they're gone. all gone. Someone's already done it. Well, sorry, 10 people have already done it. Dude, if I had 10K kicking around, I would meet Gene Kranz for lunch and go visit the room. Oh, That'd be spectacular. I'd love to get lectured and just completely torn down by Gene Kranz. Like, going, this isn't the way you do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Failure is not an option. Yep. $700, $700 pledge, go flight. Donors to this will receive a copy of Go Flight Unsung Heroes, written by Rick Houston. The book was autographed by Gene Kranz and 15 other Apollo era flight controllers on July the 20th. How cool is that? Wow. Yeah. I think I might need to back something. So the city of Webster, I believe it is, where Mission Control is matching bucks up to a certain level, uh, restoring this Mission Control room, back to what it was like during, I think it was Apollo 15. So yeah. Go sign up and help them. They want to make it so that basically it's kind of people walk through it a bunch and there's all this stuff and it's deteriorating and there's a bunch of Apollo era hardware that's no longer in the room. They want to bring it back to exactly sort of how it was during the Apollo era. So the city of Webster set forward the lead gift of $3.1 million for the campaign in early 2017. On top of this contribution, they added a challenge grant to encourage broad public participation in the campaign. 
They will match your gifts dollar for dollar up to a maximum of $400,000 to meet our $5 million goal to restore historic mission control. This is really cool. Thank you for sharing this. I'm getting a lot out of this. It's pretty cool, huh? I want to go visit this place, so hopefully they'll open it. They want to open it to the public, not the actual room, but to be able to walk past and, you know, in the viewing area and stuff. I'd like to see that. Hell yeah. Anyway, that's all I got. Good links, man. Hey, I got some good news while we were recording this. Oh, yeah? Yep. We're going to be at the podcast center at Ignite this September. Woo-hoo. We've been confirmed. We will be there doing a live show. Excellent. I shouldn't say live show. I haven't read the email fully, but it looks like... I think they'll probably do it again. I, yeah. Should I say the time that we're slated for? Or do you think it might change? Might as well. No, 11 a.m. on Tuesday, September the 26th. Come by and see us. We will be we will be live at 11 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll... Uh... We'll send an email out with the details. We'll give you a link to download a little calendar appointment and stuff. And we'll do a few things like that. You can come past and hang out. Oh my God, we forgot the biggest news. And we'll wrap, and then we'll wrap it up. Last thing. Okay, go for it. Cafepress.com slash Microsoft Cloud Show. Go buy your Microsoft, or your Microsoft Cloud Show swag. We have t-shirts. Get, get your swag. We have t-shirts. We have yeah. coffee cups. All of you that were two, episode 200 contributors, you have t-shirts that are coming in the mail in the next two weeks. Don't get turned off by the lack of design on our store. It is real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a bit more work to do on it, but yes, you can go order shirts and mugs and anything you like there. I think the shirts seem to run a little bit on the big side. I got an XL like I normally do with t-shirts, yeah. and I feel like it's, I need it to go in the dryer for a little bit longer than normal. Yeah, I got a large, at which turns out it was way too large. I need a medium, and I'm going to have to yeah douse it in cold water, get into it, and then get Vicky to, uh, to hair dry me or something like that and shrink wrap it a bit because <laughs> they're a little... It is definitely, they definitely run on the large side. Yeah, so we don't have a stock of t-shirts to give away and everything because we did it all through Cafe Press. But if a sponsor wants to fund a bunch of t-shirts and we figure out some way to get your logo on those t-shirts, I don't know, CJ and I got to figure out how we can do that to get a bunch of t-shirts done with our sponsors and stuff there on the show. So uh, we'll yeah. figure something out. But if you're a sponsor and you want to figure it out with us, let us know. Sounds good. Cool, man. Awesome. Thanks a lot for another good show. Cheers. Right, take care. Did you like this episode? Please tweet about it and drop a five-star review in iTunes. Word of mouth recommendations are the most effective ways for us to grow the show, and we'd really appreciate it. If you have a question for us, go to microsoftcloudshow.com slash questions, where you can submit it as text or record it as a wave or an MP3 and provide a link so that we can play your question on the show. Our theme music is brought to you by Keith Ritchie. For more information on Keith's music, head to music.kritchie.com. You can subscribe to us in iTunes and the Google Play Store by searching for the Microsoft Cloud Show or via RSS at microsoftcloudshow.com, where you'll also find notes of each episode. You can also find us on Facebook, searching for Microsoft Cloud Show or on Twitter at MS Cloud Show. And finally, sign up to our mailing list by heading over to our website and entering your email to interact with us, participate in upcoming interviews, and other cool stuff. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.